Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Chesson from the Lymphoma Research Foundation, and I would like to thank Mort Coleman and Rick Furman for inviting me to present at this session. The question they want me to address is, do anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies add to novel agent outcomes? Here are my disclosures. The support for using anti-CD20s in the treatment of CLL is largely from the German CLL study group, their CLL-8 study, in which patients with untreated active CLL who were in good shape were randomized to six cycles of either FCR or FC, with the primary endpoint being progression-free survival and secondary endpoints of overall survival and some molecular endpoints as well. What they showed was that on the left, there was a prolongation of progression-free survival, and on the right was a prolongation of overall survival. Thus, rituximab became a standard part of chemoimmunotherapy for CLL. So why should we use an anti-CD20 with the novel agents which have taken over the treatments of CLL? Chemotherapy is rarely used and we are mostly now uh, dependent on novel agents. Well, CD20 worked with chemotherapy. So it should work with novel agents, one would think. There are a lot of newer studies that include CD20s CD20s are relatively non-toxic. I'm used to giving it, and I'm kind of worried about not giving it to my patients. On the slide, I have listed a number of studies leading to novel agent plus CD20 approval in CLL. Of note is that in none of these studies, was there an anti-CD20 randomization. The first trial was Rick Furman's trial in relapsed refractory patients, rituximab placebo versus rituximab idelalicid, the PI3 kinase inhibitor. As you can see, the overall response rate was significantly higher and the progression-free survival significantly longer with the combination. In another Gilead study, in relapsed refractory patients, they looked at ofatumumab versus ofatumumab and idelalizumab. And again, there was a benefit in response rate and progression-free survival. In the Murano trial in relapsed refractory patients, there was a randomization between bendamustine rituximab and venetoclax rituximab. And again, the novel agent was much better with response rates and progression-free survival. In the front line, there was the ECOG-1912 in younger patients of FCR versus abrutinib rituximab. And again, the novel agent pair was much more effective with regard to response and progression-free survival. In 2019 was a publication of the Illuminate study in frontline patients Chlorambucil, yes, we still use chlorambucil in clinical trials, obinutuzumab versus ibrutinib obinutuzumab. And again, the novel agent, with no surprise, had a higher response rate and a much longer progression-free survival. More recently was the CLL-14 trial from the German CLL study group, chlorambucil obinutuzumab versus venetoclax obinutuzumab. And the novel agent one with regard to response and progression free survival. The last line is not yet approved, but I snuck it in there because it has recently been um, reported in an announcement from the company. And this is the Unity trial, which is in frontline and relapsed refractory, a randomization between chlorambucil obinutuzumab versus the new PI3 kinase inhibitor, umbrilisib 
and ublituximab, another anti-CD20, the response rates were not yet provided, but the study was stopped before completion because of the significant difference in progression-free survival. And we hope to see these data soon. But again, in none of these was there an anti-CD20 randomization, but CD20s are included in each of those regimens. Well, do the CD20s really help? Here's a study from Jan Berger, looking at a brutinib versus a brutinib plus rituximab. And in panel A, you can see that the best response in the treat naive and relapsed refractory patients was the same, around 92%, with similar complete response rates, around 20, 26%. In panel B, in the treatment naive, it seems like there may be a higher complete response rate, but it's a small number of patients. But in the relapsed refractory population, overall response and complete response are the same. There were some apparent advantages to the rituximab. For one thing, you got a faster response. You can see at 12 months, more patients had a complete response when they received rituximab, but at 24 months, it was the same. Looking at the ability to eliminate CLL cells from the bone marrow, it was faster both at 12 and 24 months, although not as notable, when you had rituximab. The absolute lymphocyte came, count came down a bit quicker, the beta-2 microglobulin, no difference. Uh, improvement in hemoglobin and platelets, no difference whether you had rituximab or not. They also looked at minimal residual disease and showed when you compare a brutinib versus a brutinib rituximab, there was a significant difference in the amount of eradication of minimal residual disease. But when you look at panel A, which is progression-free survival, no difference. When you look at panel B, which is overall survival, no difference. When you look at patients by high-risk cytogenetics, 17P and TP53 uh, mutations, there is no difference by rituximab or not. And similarly, there's really not much of a difference when you look at patients with 11Q deletions. So the author's conclusion was rituximab really doesn't add very much to the important outcomes. The Alliance-led study was in treatment naive patients with CLL, older patients, and it was a randomization between bendamustine rituximab, ibrutinib, and a brutinib rituximab. Large study, 547 patients. No surprise, the abrutinib arms were better than BR, but also, as you can see, the progression-free survival with or without rituximab was the same. And if you look at the subgroups, this just shows that abrutinib and rituximab versus abrutinib were the same. When you look at intermediate or high-risk patients, they were the same. Uh, unfavorable cytogenetics, they were the same, whether absent or present. Uh, and ZAP70 was pretty much the same also, overlapping uh, the line. So subgroups were no different. When you look at the safety of the two regimens, grade three or worse hematologic adverse events were the same. Grade three or worse non-hematologic events the same, grade five events the same, and unexplained deaths were pretty much the same. So why doesn't rituximab seem to add to a drug like abrutinib? Well, abrutinib antagonizes NK cell mediated rituximab dependent ADCC. It antagonizes anti CD20 mediated phagocytosis. It downregulates 
CD20 expression on CLL cells, and it negatively impacts CDC. Since these are off-target effects, perhaps a more specific BTK inhibitor may pair better with a CD20 antibody. In the Elevate Treatment Naive study, patients were age 65 or older, or younger if they had significant comorbidities. And there were 535 patients randomized to a calibrutinib plus obinutuzumab, a calibrutinib monotherapy, or obinutuzumab and chloramucil, with the primary endpoint being progression-free survival of a cala obinutuzumab versus chloramucil obinutuzumab. Focusing on the two Acala arms, you can see even all three arms, they're well matched with regard to age, uh, performance status, stage, and everything else, including 17P and 11Q. The Acala obinutuzumab and Acala alone had a similar number of patients ongoing, similar number of patients uh, experiencing death, uh, with progressive disease, withdrawal of cancer, all these other things, they were similar. And when you look at progression-free survival benefit across subgroups, you can see that Acala, obinutuzumab and Acala are about the same overall, uh, age over 65, uh, with regard to sex, rise stage, ECOG performance status, bulky disease, 17P, 11Q, the mutational status, and complex karyotype. The bars overlap in all of these. So when you look at response rates, it seems to be a little bit higher with the obinutuzumab. And that's mostly because of an increased number of complete responses. The partial responses are the same at 80 and 84%. But importantly, when you look at progression-free survival at a median follow-up of 28 and a half months, both arms were superior to the obinutuzumab chloramucil. There is a suggestion that the combination may have a somewhat better progression-free survival, but the study was not powered to detect this difference. Whether it's real or not will require longer follow-up. When you look at PFS by mutational status, with the dotted being mutated, the solid being unmutated, uh, there's no difference with a calibrutinib monotherapy or combination. The obinutuzumab chloramucil is lower, particularly in uh, the unmutated patient population. But overall survival is exactly the same with regard to the two calibrutinib arms, and both are better than the uh, standard arm. With regard to safety, number of patients with at least one adverse event was the same in the two antibody arms. Serious AE is the same. There were more grade three with the antibody and grade fives were the same. And if you look at most common adverse events in any treatment arm, there's a bit, the, the headaches are the same. There's a bit more diarrhea, a bit more neutropenia, fatigue, confusion, arthralgias, and others with the antibody. Most serious adverse events, uh, they're pretty comparable between the two arms. And most event, events of most clinical interest are uh, atrial fibrillations, the same, hypertension a bit more, bleeding and infections a bit more with the combination. There is another uh, novel BTK inhibitor, Zanubrutinib, and in vitro, 
In this study, it shows that abrutinib is 30-fold more likely than zanabrutinib in inhibiting rituximab-induced ADCC, and this may or may not translate into benefit when combined with an anti-CD20. But then there's the other novel agent, that being venetoclax, and there are no compar comparative data between venetoclax with or without an anti-CD20, but there is this study, a retrospective real-world experience from Anthony Mato and coworkers, comparing VEN monotherapy with VEN with either rituximab or obinutuzumab. And as you can see, there were fewer prior therapies with the combination. There were fewer patients with TP53 mutations and fewer patients with complex karyotypes. The rest remains the same. Nevertheless, progression-free survival and overall survival were very similar between the two cohorts of patients. And when you look at a bivariate analysis, looking at number of prior therapies, 17P, 11Q, complex, mutational status, et cetera, they, they are the same. And we look at adverse events, there's a bit less tumor lysis syndrome with the combination because you can debulk the patients with the antibody first, but everything else regarding neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and other toxic events are the same between the arms. There is the intergroup study of ibrutinib and obinutuzumab versus the three drugs, abrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax, continuing abrutinib in these two arms and discontinuing in that arm. The study is being conducted, one study in patients at least 70 years and another in younger patients. In the German CLL study, CLL17, patients who were previously untreated are randomized to abrutinib monotherapy, venetoclax and obinutuzumab, or venetoclax and abrutinib. But in neither of these studies, the US studies or the German study, are we looking at a CD20 question. So in conclusion, novel agents and anti-CD20s are approved for previously treated and untreated patients with CLL. Currently available randomized trials and retrospective analyses fail to support the combinations. No additional current or planned studies are directly addressing this issue. Newer novel agents with different features may be associated with improved benefit, but that remains to be demonstrated. And so with the increased associated cost of a novel agent and a CD20 while approved, these are not recommended outside of a clinical trial. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to taking any questions you may have during the Q&A period. Thank you.